I just have this sense that God is like sitting on the edge of his seat and he is so excited to reveal to you tonight something about his nature, something about his personality that you never saw before. Sweet. Something that you maybe knew but never felt and experienced and knew in your heart. That he wants to release that over you tonight. I was thinking about how he's our Heavenly Father, and how sometimes we act like he's our Heavenly Father that maybe we have like breakfast with every morning for an hour. Like we spend some time with him in the morning and then we go on our days and, he, and we don't really stay connected and attached with him all throughout the day. But I was like, God, he wants to be that Father who is in our life all day, all night. All day and all night. And I was like, God, there is so much about you that I don't even, haven't even experienced yet. And he gave me a picture of an ant crawling on an elephant. And he's like, you're like an ant crawling on an elephant. Just when you think you have me figured out because you know what my foot looks like, he's like, then I say, come on up to my back. And it's just like he is so big. And he is so wonderful and awesome. It'll take more than a lifetime, it'll take all of eternity to know how good and how fun and how adventurous and how loving and how um, much grace he has and how much patience he has. It's going to just take forever. But I really hope that tonight we'll all just get a revelation. Each one of us would get a revelation a little bit more of what he's like. Um, it was funny, two weeks ago when I taught, I was saying how, like, God gives me one passage and then I obsess over it, like, in a good way. It was funny, when, last, when, the two Wednesday nights ago that I taught, it was on the way home, I was driving home from Bible study, and God dropped in my spirit the story of the woman at the well. He's like, that's your next assignment. So, ever since then, I've been obsessing and reading over and over and over that story and getting revelations, just him speaking to me through that story. So I was like, tonight I'm excited to share some of those things. And I actually am excited that you'll get some revelation as we walk through this that I didn't get. And that you'll just get hungry for revelation, that the word of God is alive, and that when you read it, he speaks such really tender, intimate things to you. So the story of the Samaritan woman at the well is in John 4. And I'll be kind of, I'll be reading from the Passion Translation. I'll be kind of narrating slash reading because it's kind of long. So um, basically the story of the woman of the well, um, it happens when Jesus and his disciples needed to go from Judea back to Galilee. And so basically the way you get to Galilee from Judea is to go through Samaria. And the big deal about Samaria is the Jews and the Samaritans had become rival enemies for about 400 years. They hated each other and avoided each other. Um, and that really simply all started because when the Assyrians took over the Samaritans, they came and conquered them at one point, the Samaritans intermarried with Gentiles. Whereas when the... Um, enemies came in and took over the Judean territories, they didn't intermarry. They stuck together. <laughs> so the Jews got really upset at the Samaritans and said, you know what, you've corrupted our Jewish heritage. You're not Jews anymore. And the Samaritans were like, yes, we are. We're so important. So it was like this real nasty, bitter rivalry. So going through Samaria was like kind of a tough thing. It almost kind of reminds me of when you want to go to Cape Cod or Maine or something. Everybody's like, do we have to go to New York City? Do we have to go through New York City? You know, are they going to run us off the road? Are they going to mug us? It was like, you know, it's like that. It's inconvenient. We don't really want to, but that's the fastest way. You pretty much got to do it. So that was kind of like their mentality at the time. We send blessings to New York City. It is an awesome city. Yeah. That was just kind of like a funny thing. So... Um, <laughs> So um, when Jesus and his disciples arrived, they walked, of course, they came into Samaria, and they were, it was the middle of the day, it was noon, they were hot, and the Bible says Jesus was tired, and he sat down on Jacob's well, like on the, 
outer rim of Jacob's well. And he sent his disciples into town for lunch. So he's sitting there. And then here along comes a Samaritan woman to the well to collect water. And Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink of water? And surprised, she said, why would a Jewish man ask a Samaritan woman for a drink of water? So from what we know, like this was completely culturally unheard of. The Samaritans and the Jews stayed as far away from each other as possible, and rabbis absolutely were, per, were permit, um, not permitted to even speak with a woman in public, let alone a Samaritan woman in public. It just, you just, it just didn't happen. Didn't happen, never saw it, it was like, no, no. So, um, and then Jesus replied, if you knew who I was, you would be asking me for a drink because I would give you living water. And then the Samaritan woman is like, well, what are you saying? Your water is better than Jacob's water. The well here, Jacob, he's, he's our father. You know, we're Jewish too. Jacob's our father and Joseph's buried here. We're Jews. So, yeah, what are you saying? You're better than Jacob? And he's like, um, if you drink from Jacob's well, you'll thirst again and again and again and again. But if you drink the living water I will give you, you will never thirst again. Still, she's not getting it. Oh, cool, give me some, and then I don't have to go out here every day to this well. Okay, give me some. And he's like, go get your husband and bring him back. And she's like, but I'm not married. And he's like, that's true. You aren't married. The man you live with, you've been married five times, and the man you live with now is not your husband. And then she's like, whoa, um, you're a prophet. But now tell me, since you're a prophet, whose people are right? The Jewish people, are they right? Because they say you have to worship in Jerusalem. Or is my people right? Because we're Samaritans and we say you've got to worship on the mountain. So who's right about all this stuff? And he's like, she's still not getting it. She's still like, all about, I'm Samaritan and I'm important. And then he's like teaching her about worship. He's like, the time has come. Well, you don't, it doesn't matter where you worship me. It doesn't matter. The time now has come that it doesn't matter where you worship. It's that you worship me from your heart and that you worship me in the realm of the spirit and in truth. And then she's like, this is also confusing. When the Messiah comes, he'll tell us all about it and he'll take care of all this mess. And he'll tell us that you, us Samaritans are right and you Jews didn't know what you're talking about anyway. I'm like, wow, like Jesus really doesn't often keep teaching somebody who's not getting it. Like he usually says, I don't cast my pearls before this wine. And he usually kind of like, if they're not getting it, he goes somewhere else. And I was like, this is amazing. So then he said to her, um, so she said, the Messiah is going to come. He'll straighten all this mess out. So it's okay. Then Jesus says, you don't have to wait any longer. The anointed one is here speaking with you. I am the one you're looking for. Supernatural word of knowledge. Now he reveals himself to her. And then funny enough, just right at that very, very second, the disciples come back from getting lunch in town. Wow. Awkward. Jesus, a rabbi, talking to a Samaritan woman in broad, day, broad daylight. <laughs> okay, we'd really love to ask them a question, what's going on, but we know any question we'd ask right now would just be stupid. So we'll just stand here and wait for him to make the first move. Like, you can imagine, they're like, okay, now what? And at that moment, the Samaritan woman dropped her water bottle, ran back to her village, and told everybody, Come and meet the man at the well who told me everything I've ever done. He could be the anointed one we've all been looking for. And it was like amazing to me that she wasn't even looking for him for the right reasons. She just wanted to be proved that she was right, that their way of thinking was right, but it didn't matter. 
She didn't even hear. He was giving such like amazing nuggets of revelation. I mean, read over the stuff. It's like amazing revelation. She wasn't even like, it was like, woo. And I was like, Lord, why were you giving her all this good stuff when she was not even paying attention? And he was like, I needed her to hear the tone of my voice and hear me say good things that she knew that it didn't matter who she was, but who culture says she was and what she did, that she was important to me. He was so, so, so determined that he wanted to relate to her, that he wanted to connect with her. And it didn't even matter to him if she was connecting yet really with him back. He was just like, I'm going to get through. I'm going to get through. And it's funny, when she went running back to town, what did she say? She said, he, he told me everything that I've ever done, and it wasn't good. Like, and that wasn't something like you were proud of. But it's like, shame was gone. Shame was gone. Like, I could imagine myself running back to beat town and be like, there's a guy who's really smart. Maybe you want to go check him out. <laughs> but like, he told me everything I've ever done. And she's obviously struggled in relationship. He's told me everything I've ever done. Come and see him. He might be the Messiah. And then what happened next? Most amazing thing ever. Could we all not have our evangelistic encounters be like this? All the people of the village started streaming out to meet Jesus. This woman was so convinced that this man cared about her and loved her that it drew everybody. It drew everybody. Shame is like, shame is so, um, it's just a funny thing because like the minute you shine light on shame, it disappears. It's kind of like that monster that used to hide in the corner when you were a kid like the branches, the shadow of the branches across your bedroom wall when you were little. And you're like, I know, I know that's something. And then your mom comes in, what's wrong? Oh, okay, it's gone. You know, <laughs> turn the light off. There it is. <laughs> turn the light on. Oh, okay, there's nothing, it's gone. As soon as you turn the light on shame, as soon as you turn truth onto shame, as soon as you expose shame to the light, it's gone. It loses his power, and Jesus shone his light on her shame, and she, the power of her, what she had done was gone. And she was free. She was free to say, I'm going to go meet this man. She didn't go like, I'm never going back there again. He knows what I did. She's like, come with me. Let's go talk to him some more. Um... Interesting, as we were reading through about the Samaritan woman, interesting that she was kind of like a legalist. Like she was really like, we got to worship on the mountain, and I know what my religion is, and I'm doing it right. And it really made me think like how legalism is such, um, is such in a way torment. It torments our life. Religion a spirit of religion, a spirit of legalism, it says you have to always do it right. You have to always do it right. And if you don't do it right, then you're a complete failure. And she was, as much as she was troubled in some ways, she was like a legalist, which is kind of like interesting to me. Um, Relationship, when God came, he was bringing relationship. Relationship brings life, and it talks about who you are. And the legalism she was bringing brought, I have to do everything right. I have to make sure I know and do everything right. And yet legalism really leads to sin. It doesn't lead to a freedom in our life. It actually leads us into sin and bondage. And as more we try to do everything right by like the letter of the law, it's like the more we find ourselves 
not doing the letter of the law. And I was like, wow, I can relate to that. Because like, that's how I felt a lot. And when I, um, I told you guys before, like I grew up in a Christian home and I knew the Lord and I had conversations with the Lord. But I was still like so um, unhappy and felt so tormented inside to the point that when I was 16 years old, I just felt so invisible and so unlovable. I started to believe the lie that if I was prettier and if I was skinnier, then I would be loved. And that actually led me to an eight-year battle with bulimia where you binge eating and purge and a fight that felt like an addiction I couldn't get, off, get out of. But yet, I was like being, trying to be this good Christian girl and trying to do everything right. But in the end, I ended up doing so much not healthy and not right. And I was like, God. And then he was showing me how much the shame that I felt all through that time that I felt like I was so failing God and so disappointing God. And he must be like on the verge of being ticked off. Like the Bible says he's slow to anger and he's not mad. But like he's on the verge. <laughs> like that's how I felt about God. Like he's right there. Okay. Arr. Like I'm trying not to be angry at you, but <laughs> any minute it'll come out. <sighs> But God starts showing me that just like with this Samaritan woman, when we are, even when we are in our sin, he's right there talking. He's right there with us. He doesn't even turn his, he never turns even his face away from us no matter what we do. He, the only time he turned his face away was when Jesus was on the cross and he took all the sin on him. Never again. Will he ever turn his face away from us? I don't care what we're doing. If, we're, if you struggle with anger and every time you get ticked off at somebody and you tell somebody off and you punch another hole in the wall and you're like, Jesus must be so disappointed in me. He must be so like, oh my gosh, what a mess. Jesus is right there with you. And if you ask him where he is, he will show you that he's right beside you. And he's just kindly saying, just like he kindly spoke to the Samaritan woman, I have better for you than this. I have something better for you. And I thought, wow. Because I, when I tend to want to isolate, when I feel like I'm disappointing God, when I feel like I'm not, I just like, like in the Garden of Eden, like that's natural tendency. I pull away, isolate, okay, God's like disappointed. It's like, and how God helped me get free from that is one day he gave me the revelation of let me be with you through everything you go through. Like instead of me shutting him out and saying, I'm messing up so all right, go away and come back a little later. He said, let, like, see me with you in everything you do. Whether you're doing the right thing or the wrong thing, I'm there with you. Start connecting with me and seeing that I'm that kind of a God. And I started doing that. And that's what slowly and surely over time, like my victory was not a suddenly kind of deliverance. I cried out to God for deliverance for a long time, and it took this learning how to connect with Father God, letting him be near my heart. It took me letting him love me through people because I think I had a connection problem similar to this Samaritan woman. I didn't get married a bunch of times, but I had a hard time relate, having relationships, deep, meaningful relationships, connecting with people because I felt so um, bad about myself, got a legalistic spirit out of my heart. And the Lord is just going to show us tonight that no matter what, no matter what, he's right beside us saying, I have better than this for you.
So learning how to connect with God. I know it's like been a theme in our family lately because I know God really wants us to just delve into this and get it. And a lot of things like this, it takes time to really like, what does it mean to really connect with God? What does it really mean to do that? It is a treasure hunt. Like he, certain things he hid from us because it's the adventure of finding it. Like one of my favorite games as a kid was this game called Hide the Cup. <laughs> Where the grown up takes the cup and hides it somewhere in the house. And then all the kids run around the house and try to find the cup. It was, th- it was awesome. It was like, this is my favorite game. It's like, because it's so fun to find things. And God put this sense of like adventure, finding things. You ever been on a scavenger hunt? Yeah. Is it not fun? Yeah. Well, your treasure hunts, you guys do them like at the prayer walks all the time. Like it's so much fun to like, I discovered that. I went after that and I found it. So some things of God, he like makes, hides it for us, not from us. Because he knows the joy we'll have when we find it. One of the ways he, in a certain way, hides things is like when he says, he said to the woman, worship me in spirit and in truth. That's one of those really like, can sound like a really christian thing to say. It's one of our like mottos as a worship team. Worship God in spirit and in truth. That sounds really, really great, doesn't it? Like, you just feel spiritual saying it. So, and I was like, but God, what does that really, really mean to worship me in spirit? So, as I was like pondering on that, like, I just realized how amazing it is that we can get into the spiritual realm with him. He's spirit and he's given us the spirit. So we get to go into the spirit realm with him. We get to go beyond just what we see with our eyes, what we touch. And we get to break into the spiritual realm. And it's not hard. It's not hard. He didn't make it hard. We just have to want to. We just have to want to. When we get revelations and when we get, have encounters, like revelations and encounters, there are words that we use a lot, encountering God, maybe when you feel his presence, when he does something awesome that you know he's there. Um, there's two kinds, there's two kinds of revelation, like encounters. There's the sovereign encounters and then there's the faith encounters. For example, what the Samaritan woman had, that was a sovereign encounter. That was God like, you think you're just going to the well to get some water? Well, guess what? You're going to meet Jesus. (laughs) And you're going to get saved. Like, she didn't ask for it. She didn't say that morning. Jesus, I hope, you know, like it just, she was just going along and it happened. And those are awesome and those are great because you can look back on them and you'd be like, God is so real. And that felt so good. So those are good to go after and to say, God, I'm open to them. And then there's the other kind of encounter, and that's a faith encounter. And actually, for me, most of my encounters are faith encounters. That's a counter that I encounter. I say, I will, and I want to go after it. And something I love to do personally is because the Bible says, go to the throne of grace boldly. So I start out with imagining myself in the throne room of heaven with Jesus Father God, Holy Spirit, and me. And that's kind of like where I start. I'm worshiping them. I'm like, what's going on? What's going on in heaven? And I just start imagining and picturing what's going on. And then from there, all kinds of stuff happen. We have conversations. We dance. We praise. We do so many things. And then also God's been reminding me that when you even are in spiritual realms and enjoying my presence, don't forget to use all of your five senses even in the spiritual realm. You'll smell the presence, you'll hear things, you'll feel things, you'll sense things, you'll taste things. It's like use all of your senses when you're enjoying the presence of God.
And it's fun how that Samaritan woman, after Jesus leaves, she's going to have to start practicing faith encounters. We have our supernatural encounters where God comes and does amazing things. And then we have seasons where we have to, to stay connected to God. We just say, you know what, I'm going to keep on practicing this by faith. I'm going to keep on being close to him by faith. So as our story continues, starting at like verse 31, then the disciples began to insist that Jesus eat some of the food they brought back from the village. They're like, okay, good, at least we got something to do, we can eat. And they said, okay, Jesus, you need to eat something. And then Jesus says, don't worry about me. I have eaten a meal you don't know about. Puzzled by this, the disciples begin to discuss among themselves, did somebody already bring food? Where did he get this meal? Now you know what they were really thinking. That sis, she beats me to it every time. She knows where all the Dunkin' Donuts are. And she beats me to the meal thing every time. <laughs> but Jesus was talking about how much he loved. He just enjoyed his time with the Samaritan woman so much, he wasn't even hungry. You have sometimes, like, do you ever, like, pray for somebody, somebody gets saved, somebody gets healed, and you're like, you were hungry before, and then after that happens? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> hungry, what's that? You're like, food, I don't need no food. <laughs> she, he was like, I'm fine. <laughs> Then this crowd start emerging from the town. All the crowds start coming at this point to the well. And Jesus is like, why do you say the harvest is in four months? The harvest is ripe and is plentiful now. Look at them. And he's like, you get to reap what you didn't even plant. What other people worked hard for, it's just walking at you. They didn't even have an intercession prayer meeting. They weren't fasting. They were eating. <laughs> like, I can't even imagine a town being, like, thousands of people just, like, walking towards you. Like, I want to meet Jesus. I want to get saved. Ah, oh, this is coming. This is coming. <laughs> and then verse 39. So there were many from the Samaritan village who became believers in Jesus Christ because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I did. How simple. How simple. He knows all about the stuff I did and he still likes me. He told me all this stuff. I don't know what he said, but it was an, he was so nice and kind and respectful to me. I never had a Jewish man be that kind to me. So no idea what he said, but it, it really was nice. <laughs> And then they begged Jesus to stay with them. So he stayed for two more days, resulting in many more coming to faith. They had an all-out revival crusade. Then the Samaritans said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you told us, but now we've heard him ourselves and are convinced that he is the Savior of the world. They tasted and they saw That Samaritan woman and Jesus, out of that encounter, because they, they feasted off each other's love. Like Jesus said, he just loved that woman's devotion to him, and that woman just loved Jesus' kindness to him. And out of that love feast came this whole revival. And we are in this season of acceleration. We are in this season of revivals happening by the thousands. So I have a word for all y'all. You want to hear it? So I was enjoying one of my um, faith encounters in the throne room of God, using my five senses in the spiritual realm. And I was up there with the Lord, and all of a sudden I heard this loud, I shared this at Fire Pit on Sunday morning. I heard this loud cheering. Loud, exuberant, like thrilling cheering. Like awesome cheering. And I said, Jesus, what is that cheering? And he took me to like this stadium, and it was filled with saints, and it was filled with angels. 
And he said, it is a commissioning service for saints and groups of saints. And I said, what is Word Fellowship being commissioned for? He said, Word Fellowship is being commissioned to go out and feed the 5,000. This kind of stuff is coming to us. We will see the day when we'll have encounters with somebody, and next thing you know, throngs of people are coming. It's coming. And the best thing we can do to be ready is to just know how to love and receive love from God. Because if we don't receive love from God, we would be legalistic. And a legalistic Jesus never would have talked to that woman. He'd be like, this is going to totally mess things up. I mean, we've got tons of problems already with the Pharisees. I mean, it's ridiculous. So I'm not going to add to all these problems. I mean, who knows what the Pharisees are going to do with all this now? The headlines. Fox News. I mean, like, it just ain't worth it, you know, to get, it just, you know, that's what a legalistic person would say. So we have to become relational. We have to become relational to usher in revival. Relational with God is, I think I'm finding out for myself, it's a lot more fun and it's a lot more free than I thought it was. That when I was growing up, I thought it was like reading the Bible, going to church, doing the little Christian thing. That's like really good. That's where Jesus is at. And you know what? I'm discovering, and the body of Christ is discovering, the presence of God is your cheering for the eagles. The presence of God is in you enjoying a yummy, delicious dinner with your family or your friends. The presence of God is in dancing. The presence of God is in laying on the floor. The presence of God is in whatever you are doing with God in the moment. Amen. That whatever you are enjoying with God, and he, you're bringing him into it, that's connection with God, and you're hosting the presence of God. It's a lot more fun, and we find a lot more of God in our lives than, oh, it's just when we go to church. Oh, it's just when it's like the really good songs. Yeah. It's like it's our life. God can speak to us in movies. God can speak to us in billboards, anything. But it's up to us to be in tune with him and be in this season that he wants us to be like if he says, you know, right now I want you to be in a quiet season and just sit and listen. Or if he says, you know what, I want you to go talk to people. I want you to ask people questions and find things out that way. I want you to find how I'm moving. I want you to go in your town and just start asking people about, do they have hope? Do you have a hope in Jesus that he's a good God? Do you ever wonder, is Jesus, is God a good God? Do you ever wonder, I really hope one day I found out that there's a really, there's, God is a good God. I, I wonder that sometimes. The people around, the people around us, the pre-believers, do they deep inside them have a, a seed of hope? So, since we always know that we're here not to just learn stuff, but we're here to become stuff, <laughs> we want to become we want to become right. relational. We want to become connected. We want to become um, people who bring revival, yep. who just are out there ready to harvest or out there ready to sow a seed. Because God said that the one who sows the seed rejoices with the person who does the harvest. And the plowman was catching up to the reaper, and the reaper and the sower are like, kind of like on top of each other, like doing it at the same time. It's no longer the long wait. Yes. It's like it's happening so fast. But we have to be ready. We have to be relational. We have to be connected in order to be able to see and grab those opportunities and not be like, oh. If they would see me talking to that person, oh, don't know, that would not be good. But be like every person. Every person, 
every person. Every person. So I want to do a couple little activations, I call them. Fun stuff. We get to be part of breakthrough in our lives. So I know one thing for sure, that if you have felt abandoned in your life, if you have felt a lot of abandonment in your life, especially like growing up, sometimes it can be really hard to feel connection to God and to others because you feel rejection. You've never learned that connection is safe. But I feel like tonight God's saying, you know what? He wants to give you an encounter where you know that God is a good God and he's safe and he's just standing right beside you and he's just saying, I have a better way for you. So if anybody would be so brave and say, you know what, that's me, I would like prayer for that. I would just like the Lord. I would just like to give God space in my life to reveal himself to me as a good God who really loves me and wants to connect with me. Anybody feel so brave that they would like to stand and just receive that from the Lord? Just stand. If anybody would like to just receive that from the Lord. Amen. And then if anybody else, we're going to do one other. If anybody else has been like, I want to have that connection with God. I want to let him be out of my box. I want to find him outside of church. I want to find him outside of things that are Christian-like. I want to find him everywhere I go. I want to be able to connect to him in amazing, crazy ways that everybody will look at me and be like, what are you doing? You shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> what are you doing? And you're like, yes, I should. Oh, yes, I should. If that's you, would you be so bold to stand? So, Holy Spirit, we just let you work here today. We release your presence, Lord God. We just say, Holy Spirit. We choose to forgive the people in our life who taught us rejection and that we weren't good enough, taught us that lie as truth. People who made us feel belittled and small, we forgive them. And we say, Holy Spirit, would you come right now and would you just reveal yourself to me as a good father? And if you've had a hard time hearing him right now, I just want you to, in, in a whisper voice, however you want to, would you just ask him, would you say, Holy Spirit, how are you speaking to me right now in this season of my life? Just ask him that, however you would like to ask him that. How are you speaking to me in this season of my life? Because I don't want to miss it. And for those of you who stood because you just want to be like out of the box, you just want to be totally have no fear of man, no legalistic mindset, no performance mindset. You just want to say, God, wherever you lead me, I want to minister to that person that nobody else maybe would minister to. And right now, you just pray. I'm just going to pray over you right now, Lord God. I just pray you release in these people a joy. I pray you right now, just release in them an encounter and a touch of your spirit that would assure them that you are so close to them and you will never leave them and that you have such good things that they are a well of living water of the Holy Spirit gushing out of them. And that you have such an amazing, exciting plan for them, encounters for them, such exciting, exciting things ahead of them. And would you, in your own way, ask Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, how have you been speaking to me in this season of my life? I don't want to miss it. Amen. 
Amen. So you can all be seated. Okay, everybody, have a great night. Enjoy connecting with the Lord.